How can you experience joy no matter what is happening around you? This is the Leaders of Transformation podcast. And on this show, we interview difference makers and world changers who are disrupting for good. I'm your host, Nicole Jansen, and our guest today is Tommy Newberry. Tommy is the author of seven books, including the New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestseller, The 4-8 Principle, as well as the motivational classic, Success is Not an Accident, both of which have been translated into dozens of languages. Tommy has de dedicated the last 30 years to helping entrepreneurs and their families to maximize their God-given potential. He has helped business leaders in more than 30 different industries work less, earn more, and create a greater significance in with the right accomplishments. Today, we're going to talk about the 4-8 principle. What is it? Why is it so important to our joy and well-being? And uh, certainly in a world where there's so much negativity and, and toxic behavior, uh, we can shift the narrative. And Tommy's going to show us how to do that and how to bring about positive change in our lives as well as the lives of other people. Now, before we dive in, I do want to do a shout out to Interview Valet. Tom and Karen Schwab, who are the founders and their team, are amazing. They have been supporting this show for many, many years, and we just really appreciate them. And I always love giving a shout out to those that support this show. So thank you to them for introducing me to Tommy. And uh, one last thing, this podcast is actually brought to you by my training and coaching company, which is the Leaders of Transformation. And if you are a leader who wants to be better, do better, and make a greater impact, go to leadersoftransformation.com forward slash coaching, and you can book a free consultation with me. We'll talk about your goals, your challenges, and the breakthrough that's necessary in order for you to become the leader that you are capable of being. And there's a scheduling link on that page. So with that, let's bring our guest on. Tommy, welcome to Leaders of Transformation. We're glad you're here today. Glad to be with you, Nicole. Been looking forward to it. Likewise, likewise. Yes, we've had to reschedule this a few times, but here we are all in good time, I always say. And uh, so right. let's... Let's talk about your books. Um, you know, I, I love this 4-8 principle and, um, and, it's, and it's really the principle for all of the other books and everything that you do. Tell us how it came to be your kind of life focus and life verse. Well, it, um, first of all, the four and the eight represent a Bible verse um, that means a lot to me. It's Philippians 4.8. Philippians is in the New Testament. It's a very short book of the Bible, um, but it's often called the joy book because it's all about joy, which means it's really all about mindset and thought life and how you pray and how you think and how you interact. And, and so I got introduced to Philippians 4.8 by my grandmother when I was about 14. We called her grandmother, Grandma Lily or at least that's what my kids called her. They barely knew her, but um, she gave me a bookmark and it had Philippians 4.8 on it. And it didn't mean that much to me at age 14, but I stuck it in my Bible and carried it with me and had it in college. And then when I got into coaching, it started to have more significance because as I began working with people, there would be all the tactical things you could do the very tangible things you could do to improve somebody's performance. But I noticed that if they focused on the wrong things, they still would be without the joy that they craved so much. Um, and then I was teaching actually a Sunday school class. I was in my early twenties. I wasn't even married, but it was a couple Sunday school class. I don't know how that even happened. And I shared Philippians 4, 8, and it just hit me how powerful that is in a relationship of any kind, whether it's husband, wife, or parent, child, or, you know, team leader to your team, boss, employees, what do you focus on? Do you focus on what is deficient or do you focus on what is sufficient? Do you focus on what is broken or what is beautiful? And so the words of the apostle Paul in Philippians 4, 8 are this, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is lovely, pure, true, gracious, just, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think on these things. Or in different translations, it's dwell on these things, meditate on these things. Or my favorite uh, ending is 
from the amplified version, fix your mind on these things. I really like the idea of fixing your mind versus your mind darting all around like that. So to put this in proper context though, Paul was in prison when he wrote those words. If I put it in modern day lingo, it would be focus on the good stuff. Just focus on the good stuff. But Paul was in prison. He was chained. He was under guard. And according to most scholars, he was knee deep to waist deep in sewage. And he wrote the words, whatever is lovely, pure, true, gracious, just, or in, in different interpretations, it says brilliant, noble, of good rapport. He said, focus on these things. So he was so far ahead of his time in understanding psychology and the biochemistry of emotions, really. He knew that if we dwelled on the wrong things, we would feel the wrong way. And, and then it's really cool. I think the whole existence of that verse is so powerful and it's lost, by the way. It's Philippians 4, 6, and 7 is a very famous verse about petitioning to God. And then here comes Philippians 4, 8. And then at the end, it says, do these things and the peace that only God can give will be with you. But it's, it's not that much of, I couldn't find any book ever written on it. So this was back in 2004 or five when I got the idea uh, or I got working on the idea. I couldn't find any book that had ever been written on Philippians 4, 8. I found a John Maxwell book that that was <clears throat> about Philippians 4, 8, but only from the standpoint of he put a whole bunch of other people's quotes in a book so as to give you something lovely and excellent to dwell upon. But there wasn't really a commentary ab around Philippians 4, 8 or how it could be beneficial to your life. But here's what Paul knew. He knew we were not automatically positive. How would I know that? Because he gave us Philippians 4, 8. No. You wouldn't need that if you were automatically positive. And then I knew, then I realized he knew we were not hopelessly negative either for the same reason. He, w he wouldn't give us instructions that were in vain, that wouldn't work. So he knew that we were kind of on the center line. We could fall to the negative. We could fall to the positive depending on life circumstances. But he wanted to, he had a higher standard. So he said, here's, here's what God wants for you. He wants you to walk around in joy because that brings more people in. So in order to do that, you need to look at all situations, circumstances, relationships, and focus on the good in them rather than the bad. And that doesn't mean that you focus, you forget or you ignore the bad or you stick your head in the sand. It just means you don't dwell upon it. You know, we, we need to work on problems in a relationship. We need to work on business problems. We need to work on health problems, but we don't need to marinate in them. And too often we marinate in our problems rather than trying to fix them. So my grandmother introduced me to it. I found that it had great practical value, even though it sounds philosophical and poetic, it's really tactical. And then when I started testing it with clients and couples, I was blown away because it was so simple. I almost felt embarrassed to share it, but they said, because it's so simple, I can actually apply it. You know, is my, is what I watched on Netflix last night? Is that, did that pass the four, eight test? Did that conversation that I had in the elevator, did it pass the four, eight test? What was I talking about over dinner last night? Did it pass the four, eight test? So I found it to be a very practical, uh, very pragmatic uh, filter for what we ought to think about and then what we ought to not think about. And it has spilled across, as you referenced, it's kind of spilled across all of my coaching. Yeah. Well, you mentioned about Paul being in a prison. And I think that's so important to recognize the context in which he wrote that because it's one thing when things are going well to focus on what is good and lovely and pure and of good report. It's another thing to do it in the most difficult of, of situations. That's when it, that's when the rubber meets the road. That's when I love what Joel Osteen, he said once, he said, don't use your words to describe your situation. Use your words to transform your situation. Yeah. Love that. Love that. You know, and, and it's, and it's, 
you know, it's so easy to say and it's difficult to do. It can be, can be difficult to do, especially if we're conditioned. Otherwise, I was talking to a client last week and, and, you know, he was struggling with this actually, right, is to stay focused and stay optimistic in the midst of all the things that are going on in the world. And I said to him, I said, so like, how much McDonald's can you eat before you get sick? Like how, how much is the balance, you know, where you, you need to know what's happening in the world, but it's perspective, like you said, not dwelling on it. If you're spending too much time on it, you know, quite frankly, I think 10%, 20%, that's already far too much McDonald's and sorry for McDonald's yeah. fans, yeah. but it's not the greatest uh, nutritional food. So that's why I'm using that as an example, but you know, it's like we garbage in garbage out when we eat junk food that we get junk out, right? We feel sluggish. We, we don't feel at our optimal. And so what you're talking about here is it's like racing fuel. It's like the, the best quality. And, um, and it's not just in, like I said, it's not just in the good times. It's also in the, and more importantly, in the well, difficult it, times, because that's how we get out of the difficult times into the next. Yeah. I mean, but you need, it's almost like we need, you know, when we're in everyday life, and there's no major crisis going on, we should really work to practice the 4-8 principle yes. during the routine times so that it's not this big ask when a yes. crisis hits or when an adversity hits. So it's, yes. I like this phrase, um, I was just doing a, a session on adversity and it was um, prepare for the storm ahead of time. You know, get ready for the storm ahead of, it's not being negative, you know, this is wisdom. Yeah. Yeah. Prep and preparation is inherently positive. So you don't, you know, sit around worried and, and, and tense that a storm is coming by the very fact that you're boarding up the windows, that you're making sure you have enough food, you're doing the wise things to prepare that lowers the intensity of the negative emotions because you know, you're, you're handling what you can control. And, and I think it's, it's very powerful from a joy standpoint. If you want to have joy, you can't have joy if you're thinking junk thoughts, or you can't have joy if you're thinking stressful thoughts, but we, we try to, but nobody, nobody can think a stressful thought and experience joy or think joyful thoughts and experience stress. You have to choose. And I yeah. think sometimes, I mean, I've done it, you know, I've almost thought I earned you know, being stressed out or I deserved it, or this is such a tough situation. I should be able to lose my cool or, you know, let my guard down, but it's kind of like you just find, found out you have a, a health problem. Would you want to go eat at McDonald's or would you want to start downing a bunch of Snickers bars that helps you feel good maybe for a few minutes, but then the, the after effect makes you feel worse than you did before. So I love that comparison of positive mental nutrition with with physical nutrition it's a it's a very similar parallel you can't expect joy if you put junk in and you can't expect energy and vitality if you feed yourself you know fast food yeah this brings up a point joy versus happiness a lot of a lot of people use them interchangeably they are different so talk about the difference well, <clears throat> joy, I like to think of joy as proactive happiness. Joy is something that you make a decision. That's how you're going to live. Um, and you can be joyful even when you're in dire circumstances. You can be joyful because you're focusing on the big picture. You're focusing on the blessings that you have. You're focusing on the great memories um, if you're happy, happy is a great thing. We want people to be happy too, but happy tends to be, you know, you wake up and it's a beautiful sunny day. You're happy. You know, you, the, the deal you've been working on closes, you're happy. You know, the evening goes the way you want to, you're happy. Nothing wrong with that at all. It's just, it's dependent upon outside circumstances and joy is dependent upon inside circumstances. Since cool. our outside circumstances are not always going to be perfect, then it's kind of like a roller coaster, which is how most people are. They, 
they kind of act like they're not in control of whether they're in a good mood or a bad mood, whether they're joyful or, or bitter. They just kind of act like it's happening to them. So if you wake up in the morning and your first thought is a predetermined thought, which is what we teach all our, our clients, wake up, you know, decide the night before. In fact, it's best to just to decide, here's what I'm going to think every morning, first thing, no matter what. You could go spiritual and say, this is the day which the Lord hath made. I'm going to rejoice and be glad in it. Or you could just have a good positive affirmation. I believe something wonderful is happening to me today or anywhere in between. But you just decide that's when the alarm goes off or when your, when your device that you're wearing starts to vibrate and it's time to get up. The first thought is something that is 4-8. And, and then once that has happened, then that's kind of a reminder that, hey, today I choose is my default to focus on what I love about her, what I love about us, what's great about this situation, or am I going to just let the raw emotion of what happens steer me? And in which case, I, you'll have good days and bad days, but it seems like you're going to have a lot of suspense because you don't really know what, what's going to happen. So if it rains, you're going to be unhappy. You know, um, I was at, at the lake this past weekend with a bunch of teenagers and it, you know, they were hoping for nice weather, but it just poured the whole time, but it was up in the mountains and you know what, there was no thunder, there was no lightning. So they were just all out in the lake, all outside. They did not let, you know, this was like the last kind of long weekend before you get into the fall. They did not let the outside circumstances ruin their fun. And that's how we should all be. You know, yes. no, rain or shine, we're going to have a good day because we've made that choice to do it. Yeah, it, it's interesting because the the common theme on this podcast, we talk about transformation, you know, being the change. There's like this shirt, which uh, I just had yeah. the, the, this new branded shirt, my first attempt at a uh, some, some merch. And, you know, this idea of being the change, being the transformation first before you can lead it in others and it's a consistent theme of like choosing your focus choosing what you focus on choosing your words choosing your state and the guest we just had on recently joel green he wrote a book called filtering and he talks about filtering ideas this is that same concept and it's there's there's people ask sometimes like what why am i not succeeding like other people are succeeding and yet success leaves clues you know, there's indicators. This is what successful people do. And you can go across the board and I've interviewed over 400 and this is going to be 430, episode 430. All these right. different people from different walks of life, from different countries, and they are all basically saying the same thing. And may not be what our focus topic is for the episode, but it is underlying all of it, which is what are you focused on? And what you focus on is what expands and what you get in your life. And it gives you the opportunity, like you said earlier, it's like, if you focus on this, you're going to get, you're going to get something that's like the fruit of that. The roots determine the fruit. And I, and I love that. Now I know you talk also about, cause you talk about clients, not just being joyful in your personal life, but also in business and what that means. And you're helping people to grow very successful businesses. And you talk about the hidden costs of scattered thinking. And so let's talk about it from the flip side. What is the cost? of not doing it this way that you're talking about. Yeah, and that's what I was thinking before you even used that question leading up to it. I was I was thinking that, that in addition to the positive angle of being like positive and joyful, there's also the productive angle of focus. So I believe that, that if you're, for example, you're born a B talent, like the letter grade B, you're born a B talent. It's kind of a good place to be born because you have enough talent to accomplish anything you want to, but you don't have so much that you can get cocky or arrogant about it. And so when you have that B talent, you work hard and then maybe you realize, you know what, I need to focus on one thing and you stay focused on it. And because you've got a good work ethic, you're not cocky you stay focused on that one thing and can make it a success. What often happens if you're born with a little more talent 
you end up having an over what I call an overactive yes gland. You say yes to too many things and all of a sudden your plate has five, six, seven big projects on it and you're taking this one 20%, this one 40%, this one 70, this one 40, this one 55, but you're never quite taking anything across the finish line because your, your focus is scattered. And so there's the positive negative angle, but there's also the focused scattered angle. And if you're scattered, you're dispersing your creative energies, your productive energies. It's gonna take you longer to get traction and to pull projects across the finish line, or worse, you'll never really, you'll never really see a, a honest picture of your full potential because you've spread yourself too thin. So I like to think of success as far more sequential, meaning you focus on one thing and then you build that to a success, then you build, then you add to it. Rather than having going wide, you go deep. And then as you get success, legitimate success, then you can add things to it. So when you're scattered, it takes you longer to get things accomplished. It's harder to pay attention. You don't become the best at it. And your attention jumps around, you know, to different things. It's, it's kind of like when I write, I will spend at least a whole day writing. Um, I try to write a little bit every day. That can work for some people. Doesn't work for me. I like to block a whole day. I remember when I was when I was writing this book, The First 4-8 Principle, I had weeks blocked off. I'd go a week and then I'd do the rest of my business because I kind of had to do the books like I was moonlighting. And then I'd have another week set aside and I'd write it. I wrote one of my books in three weeks. And that's because I, I got behind and I cleared my calendar. I got an air mattress for my office and I did go home some, but I, I worked late for three weeks and I got a whole book done in three weeks. It was with uh, Thomas Nelson, now Harper Collins. Uh, it was called I Call Shotgun. It was a series of letters that I wrote uh, to my three sons, things that I wanted them to learn from dad before they learned it from the culture. And um, so granted, it was kind of easy to write that kind of book because it just kind of came out. But that's what happens when you focus is you see what you're capable of. If you're, if you're stretched too thin, you're maybe hectic, you're running a little behind for appointments, you go to bed and you don't have your to-do list done and they carry over to tomorrow and then they carry over to the next week, you're not seeing your full potential. And that, that happens to very capable people. It's just that they put too much on their plate. So a lot of what we do on the coaching side versus kind of just the, the mindset side is we get people to stop. You know, we are really big on two stop lists like T-O-S-T-O-P, to stop. What do we need to stop doing? Because I found that my clientele tend to have bigger breakthroughs not by what they do, but by what they stop doing. And what, why? Because when they stop doing something, it frees up all this other time to work on the things that really move the needle. Um, so that's the danger of scattered thinking is that you'll never get to see what you were really capable of unless you close that gap and get focused. Well, I love that you said that because I don't know how many times I've had a client say to me, and I work with high performers who are always in doing mode and they say, what do I need to, I want you to tell me what I need to do more of. And I say, well, the very fact that you're asking that question tells me the real question is, what do you need to do less of? What do you need to stop doing? And because that's, you know, that gives you, like you said, that gives you the space and time to do the things that are really important. And I wanted to talk to you about, and this is such a perfect segue into this, is talking about self-concept because you address that in your book, we talk about self-ideal, self-image, and self-worth. And I think about if you are, if I'm focused on, or I'm, I'm, if I'm focused on one thing versus focusing on a lot of things, my confidence goes up, right? I feel good about myself. I'm in my sweet spot doing what I'm, what I'm great at and 
creating results and feeling good about those results. On the flip side, if I'm not, and I'm scattered in my thinking, then, and I've noticed this many times with myself and also with clients is that when that happens, it's like, they are, they're saying my confidence isn't where it should be because I'm not doing that. Da, da, da. It's really impacting their self-concept and their self yeah. image based on this, what you're talking about, this scattered thinking. It's another cost to this scattered thinking. Aside from what you talked about is that it's just going to take longer. You know, it's like, you look, you're writing, you're doing three projects, you're writing three books and it takes, let's say it takes 10 hours to do it. Well, now you, it takes you 30 hours to get all three of those across the line versus the 10 hours if you just did the one and then stacked like you were talking about. But um, yeah, so talk about this self-concept and what kind of steps can we also take to be able to improve our self-concept? Yeah, and so first let me go back and I'm gonna give one good example of that you said something before we segued that made me think about the, the stopping and starting because it kind of leads back to the, the self-concept anyway. So I had a client, this was after, this was like just 90 days. And in the 90 day window, he came back in, this was a group of about 25 entrepreneurs. And we were all doing our updates where everybody gets a minute, minute and a half to kind of stand up and, and proclaim to the rest of the group, what you got accomplished. And he said he, he was able to triple his income in the last quarter quarter over quarter and quarter over the quarter from the previous year. And everybody in the room, and these were bright half a million dollar and up people, this was about 10 years ago, half a million and up earners, small business owners, they said, what did you do? 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 And he just kind of smiled. And I thought I knew what was coming. And he said, you're asking the wrong question. It's what I stopped doing it allowed me to then put my time on my highest value activities. And that's what created the spike. It wasn't what I did, but everybody's natural inclination is to go, what did you do? What'd you do? What'd you do? What'd you do? So then segueing to the self-concept, I think there's something similar in that I believe I had this is I didn't have the confidence that project A was going to get me where I wanted to go. So therefore I thought, well, I need to do this too. I need to be working on this book while I'm doing this, while I'm introducing this new program. And, you know, in addition to the kind of the frenzied uh, life and hours and health issues that may cause, none of that could be as good when you're dividing yourself and your, your mindset across all those different things. So I came to understand that taking on too many things also is a clue. It's not definitive evidence, but it's a clue that you might have a little bit of a scarcity mindset. In other words, you're not believing in the value of just one project. So you're thinking, I've got to do this and this and this and this. And the irony is, if you to put all of your attention into the first one, you could have created something that had a lot more value. So, all right, so to the self-concept, because the self-concept is, it can be kind of heavy, to talk about it. So I'll, I'll do it as picturesque as I can think of it, but there is something, there's a lot of selves that we're going to touch on. The self-concept is generally how you see yourself, how you think of yourself. So you can probably do this. I do this, but if I hear somebody talk for four or five minutes, I have a pretty clear idea of their self-concept because I'm listening to the way that they talk about themselves and others and how they describe opportunities. Are they using uh, the words that are winner type words? Or are they using more victim type words? Or you reference Joel Osteen and transforming your situation with your words versus describing it and so forth. So your self-concept is like your mental software. And it's a conglomeration of all of your life experiences, your beliefs, your expectations, um, your assumptions about the world. And it's broken down into three pieces, your self-ideal, which is the future, your ideal self. It hasn't happened yet, but it's the image. You have one, I have one, everyone listening and, and, and watching has a self ideal. It's if you could operate on our mind, if, what a surgeon would see is they would see you have this image of the best case scenario that could possibly happen to you. 
We all have it. It's unconscious generally, and it affects it, how we move through life and what decisions we make. It's almost like a GPS coordinates that have been planted and all of our decisions, even if they meander, move us toward that self ideal. If it's unconscious, meaning we've just let our environment, our family, our friends, our coworkers, the culture shape it, then it's kind of, you know, I read, you know, at least a yellow flag, a caution flag, or we'll come back to that. Cause that's the one where as a coach, we can make the greatest impact with somebody if they upgrade their self ideal. So then there's a the self image. That's how you and I see each other today. But how, I think of myself as somebody who's fit. Um, I think of myself as somebody who can think quickly on their feet or that i am got plenty of money or that I'm successful at this or good at that or not so good at this or I'm great at tennis but not good at golf. In other words, whatever my pros and cons are, that's how I see myself today. So the self-ideal is the future. Self-image is how you see yourself today. And then the bottom rung, not in any order of importance, is your self-worth. The self-worth is how valuable and worthwhile you consider yourself to be outside of your accomplishments. So there's kind of a spiritual element here, uh, which is why I love it. Um, so if you think that you're a high quality person because you've accomplished this and this and this and this, then that's not really self-worth. That's what's called self-efficacy. See, there's too many selves in here, but we want our clients to to feel terrific about themselves because they realize they are a unique, one of a kind creation of God, a beautiful, wonderful child of God. All three of my boys, the first words they ever heard from dad were, you are a beautiful, wonderful child of God. Even when I was alone, I would sing to them. If nobody was around, you know, you are a beautiful, wonderful child of God. I try to turn that into some kind of harmony. If you believe that you're a beautiful, wonderful child of God, then it changes how you perceive the rest of the world, what kind of risk you want to take and so forth. So at the bottom level is you have your self-worth. If you have a strong sense of self-worth, you're going to take a lot of risk. You're going to have, you're going to be comfortable in your own skin. You're not going to be a pretender. You're going to have less self-deception and none of us are perfect in this area. We've all got flaws and blemishes. And then the self image, how we see ourselves today can be improved by how we talk to ourselves. I feel healthy, I feel happy, I feel terrific. I believe something wonderful is gonna to happen to me today. So what I tell myself has the greatest impact on my self-image. The second most important would be my, my wife. What she says to me really builds me up. For my children, one of them is married. So the one who's married, it would be his wife, it'd be himself and then him, and then still me, because he's 26, I still play a big part in his life. My 16 year old, I'm other than him who's 16, I would probably still, and my wife would be the biggest influencer along with his friends. That's where it's tricky. So then the self ideal, how do we take that from being something that just happens to us to something that actually transforms us? One way to do it is to create a detailed personal mission statement. So you take that best case scenario for the rest of your life, your legacy, and instead of letting it just happen to you, you define it, you articulate it in writing. We have a couple of different ways that we do it. One is called personal mission statement, but it's a long one, like a page long. And the other one's called a master vision, but they accomplish the same thing. They create a definite premeditated GPS destination. So no longer are you thinking, what should I do this week or this year? You're going in light of where I want to be long-term, what is the wise thing to do that would get me there? So the, the self ideal, it, we all have them and we all have turn by turn instructions that either get us closer to it or move us further away. The self ideal is impacted by speaking to ourselves as we would if God had his hand on our shoulder and said, you can do it. Nicole, you've got it. I've got your back. You know, how would we, how would we interact with people? What risks would we take if our creator 
was in physical form encouraging us. And then the self-worth, how do we make that better? Is we remind ourselves of our true identity, you know, of our spiritual self. And then we don't get so consumed with comparing ourselves to others, but just are we better than we were yesterday? Am I, is Tommy better? Is Nicole better than she was yesterday? Am I better than I was yesterday? So those things I think are really cool. They're just kind of heavy, you know, to talk about. So the, the shortcut to just bypass it all is to get a clear written vision for who you want to become and to have it, you know, in some kind of document and then to look at it every morning and just automatically if you look at, these are my ideals, this is the kind of person I want to become. And if you're looking at that every morning, then your, your computer, your mental computer is automatically going to course correct. So a lot to metabolize, but I hope that made a little bit of sense. Absolutely. Uh, and I love that. And that's a topic that's near and dear to my heart is identity is who are we and really getting who we are in Christ, who we are. God, how, God has made us a certain way um, beautifully, fearfully, wonderfully made, yes, you know, love and, that, love that. and it's like, wow, if we really got that, uh, that how would we, how would we live our lives? How would we, how would we see ourselves? How would we see others? How would we see the world around us based on I that? Think it's if, so important. I think the the beautifully, wonderfully made, if we can really realize that, I mean, I, I'm sure I've got long, a lot of room to grow in that area, but I mean, if we could really realize that and accept that as the truth, I mean, everything else would just kind of unfold. I mean, I think that is almost the main thing to work on spiritually is to recognize that of who you really are. And yeah. one of the cool things that, that has come out in sports psychology, for example, is is when people have a strong, and this is even without the spiritual piece of it, but when people have a strong sense of who they are, that their worth is not dependent upon making the Olympic team or scoring the touchdown or earning more than anybody else, you know, right out of college, when they realize their, their true identity is something far more valuable, guess what happens? They end up being so relaxed that their performance goes through the roof. Yes. It was like the tennis players that, that had been, you know, conditioned by their parents, I'm not even saying it's a bad thing, to, to love tennis, to work toward the Olympics and to, you know, be the top of their game. A lot of them get burned out. Yeah. And the, and the ones who don't. It becomes work. Yeah. The ones who don't are playing for the love of it. They just love to play. They love to compete. And because their parents' approval, mommy and daddy's approval is not dependent upon the next serve or winning the match, they often win the match because yes. they're so relaxed. Win or lose, God loves me. Win or lose, mommy and daddy love me. And we all have a little bit of that in ourselves to where are we trying to prove something or are we trying to become something? And I think we have more success when we try to become something. And it's a lifetime of work for everybody because the, the closer you come, to your full potential, you see how much more you could grow. And it's kind of exciting and frustrating, you know, at the same time. Yeah. Well, but you're also either growing or dying. So, you know, I don't want to get to the point where I've completely tapped out, you know, there's nowhere else to go because what fun is that, you know? And, uh, and so what we're, there's so much here that we could talk about Tommy. Oh my gosh. Um, this has been so great. And I know your books uh, talk about these things, unpack these in more detail. So we're going to direct our listeners because I just I had the whole list of other things to do. Maybe we'll have to get you back here because I had whole other things. Love that, to come back, yeah, yeah, yeah. To, to talk about. And uh, you know, I think it was self help addiction, the dangers of that, and you know, all the different the day blocking, all the things that you do with your clients that I think would be so so valuable. But I know they're in your books, so uh, we're going to recommend that. That everyone goes to uh, TommyNewberry.com, your website, and get a copy of your uh, books. You have seven books there they can check out. Starting with, I recommend the 4-8 principle as a starting point. 
And uh, then you get that principle and everything else follows from there. But you also have a 40 day joy challenge. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, the 40 day joy challenge is a essentially a video devotional. It's ironically 40 days. And each day there's a five to seven minute message, video message with some cool motion graphics. And it ends with a drill. And there's kind of a bonus drill if you want to put 10 or 15 minutes into it. But if you just want to do the short one, it's essentially this question every day for 40 days, which is as a result of today's lesson, what are you going to do differently? And we're looking for like one sentence. So it's loosely based on the 40 days to a joy filled life or the, the sequel to that. There's about four of these, including one for teenagers called think for eight has a red cover and it's for younger teenagers. The message is so important to get instilled early in life. But for those of us who are grown or maybe as a couple, we want a devotion that, that comes to life. The 40 day joy challenge accomplishes that in less than nine minutes a day. And it has a cumulative effect. So if you read a book, that's good, but it, we don't tend to take as much action as if we're hearing it, seeing it, and then somebody gives us a, a drill that we have to use our hands. So I like using your head, your mouth, your hand um, in order to affect change. And so we have a lot of couples that are doing it together, families that are doing it, um, you know, around the dinner table since it's pretty short. Um, but it's joychallenge.com and we've got a gift for, for all of your listeners. We're going to, that's going to be absolutely free with the coupon code that we, um, that you're going to supply, I guess, in the, in the show notes. So awesome. people Thank can go you. through the whole that's 40 great. days, um, and you can get as many people to go through it as you want. And I think it'll transform, uh, the minds. And if you transform the mind of somebody, you transform the rest of their life. Amen. Yes. Thank you so much. And appreciate that gift. So we'll make sure that that is in the show notes uh, on the website. So for those of you that are listening or watching, you can go and, uh, and access that now. And Tommy, thank you so much. I really appreciate it and appreciate what you're doing. And it inspires me because it's, it's so much in line with um, which makes sense because we're actually reading the same stuff. <laughs> So, that's right, that's but, you right. know, it's where we're getting our, our uh, material and it's just so in line with, you know, change your focus, change your words, change your state. Um, you know, it's all so, so important. And I believe that leaders of transformation take action. And so, you know, for you that's listening out there or watching, you know what, all this information is great, but unless just like uh, Tommy talked about the, the drills Unless you take action and do something with it, nothing happens. So take something today, whether it's getting a copy of one of Tommy's books, whether it's taking something that he talked about here today, ideally, just even while you're waiting for that book to arrive, is to take action on something. Start asking yourself, what am I focused on right now? Am I focused on the positive or am I focused on the negative? Am I focused on what I'm able to accomplish or fearing the thing that, I, that, you know, that might happen? What if? And so really start thinking about what it is that you're thinking because your thoughts will determine your feelings, which will also play out in your physical. It all ties together and it is so, so important um, for success. Yeah, let me, but, let me jump, yes, let me jump in and say one last mm. thing that I'm just, it strike, hits me over the head right now is, you know, why settle, particularly when we're addressing leaders, why settle for small incremental change when you can have transformation? There I mean, you go. Transformation. Yes is inherently more motivating because yes, it's nice to have a little bit of an incremental change to make our marriage a little bit better, to grow our team a little bit more, to grow the bottom line. But transformation is what would make you want to get up an hour earlier, you know, stay up an hour later, uh, change what you listen to in the car, change how you communicate with your spouse. Transformation is inherently, I think, more compelling as something to work for. And if you're a leader, that's the only thing I think that you should have on your mind is transformation. Um, That's right. Not just, you know, baby steps. Yeah. And transformation, when you, when you, when something is transformed, it does, it never goes back to the same way that it was before. It oh, is yeah, literally transformed. Like the caterpillar turns into a butterfly. The butterfly is never going to become a caterpillar again. And so 
rather than just the incremental changes where you can kind of slip back, go for, go for the fence and, uh, and make and create the transformation in your life and also in the lives of those around you. And that's where, that's where the re results really show. So again, Tommy, thank you for that extra little nugget. And we just appreciate uh, everyone who's been listening and watching, and we hope you've enjoyed this. If you like this episode, please uh, share it, give us the rating and review wherever you're, you're able to do that in your favorite uh, podcast listening platform, but share this with others. You know, there's a lot of people right now that are struggling. The reason why I brought Tommy to this show today and, and other guests as well, even recently specifically talking about this topic of changing your mindset, shifting your mindset in the midst of difficult times, because there's a lot of people right now that are struggling. And so if you know someone like that, share this with them, give them a, a word of encouragement, so that they can keep moving forward and uh, get beyond the situation that they're in, see even the situation differently so that they can actually create uh, better results going forward and better outcomes. So we encourage you to do that. We'd love to hear your stories. Go on leadersoftransformation.com. You can reach us through that uh, website. You can also, of course, find us on social as well. And we appreciate you and we look forward to seeing you next time for another episode of the Leaders of Transformation.